Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And um, I'd just like to thank the organisers for in, uh, inviting me today to, and to take part in what is such a seminal event. Um, talking to many of the people who have been involved in this area, uh, the US have had, what, their fourth or fifth um, PMWC conference. This is the first time it's been held in the UK. So it's a great privilege for me to be here. We've heard over the last two days some tremendously exciting news about how the science is rapidly evolving and the huge and significant potential going forward in terms of personalized medicine. So, so I'm going to focus on a slightly different question today. Given all this scientific advancement, what are the implications for personalized medicine in terms of how we're going to implement it? And what sorts of capabilities, what sort of organizational structures, and what's going to be the underlying economics that's going to make personalized medicine work? Now, we're at the state of evolution in terms of personalized medicine where you can guarantee that every conference you go to, there will always be a diagram that refers to Moore's Law. We're at that stage. And I, too, have that slide. It's clear that the economics of the underlying platforms and genomic sequencing are getting more attractive year by year. We're seeing a compound annual reduction of around 6% in terms of the cost of DNA sequencing. That in turn inevitably leads to a dramatic increase in the number of sequence genomes that we have available, rising some estimates to around 1.6 million by the end of 2016. And given that underlying change in economics, it's inevitable that we're seeing a greater transition from genomics from an experimental phase into an application phase. And again, these numbers should all be familiar to everybody here. A very significant increase, 350%, in the number of FDA-approved biomarker-driven TXs over the time period of 1989 to 2009, and in turn, driving a dramatic increase in the level of DX testing. But the question I'm going to raise today is, does Moore's law really work? Are we really in that environment? And the reason, reason why I first want to raise that question is, if we look at just the range of capabilities and resources that are going to be required to take personalized medicine into the clinical world and apply it to patients, we see a significant increase in complexity. First of all, just in the area of the generation of genomics data, there are challenges around the science, around analytics, around data management, about privacy, about engagement of patients, patient consent, as well as a whole series of technical issues around IT management and strategic relationship management. So even at the very fundamental stages, we're seeing a dramatic in need and increase in a new set of capabilities. And that continues as we start to transit along the value chain. So as we move into the application of genomics into treatment and the clinical application, again, we see the same pattern. You know, clear capabilities around portfolio management, real issues around how we get genuine patient involvement and engagement, how we structure and analyze the data, how we clean the data, how we maintain the privacy, how we build the analytical skills, how we redesign the protocols, how we build the skills on the ground for interpretation, how we deal with the uncertainty, how we build the reimbursement models, how we provide the resource and economics. These are major substantial changes in systems that traditionally are very conservative both in the pharma sector and in the healthcare sector, the ability of those sectors to evolve and apply this new thinking to build those capabilities is not going to be straightforward. So we just have to hold in our minds that the scientific progress may not be matched by the same level of progress in terms of allocation of resources and development of new capabilities. And unless we're conscious about those challenges, we will not see the full benefits of precision medicine being applied across the clinical setting. So we really do have to understand those challenges. So let me just drill down and bring a couple of those into a bit more focus and detail. So first of all, in, in, well, in the pharmaceutical companies, clearly one of the fundamental issues is how they're going to implement and design agile pathways, or adaptive pathways, whichever term you prefer. So how are we going to move to a model where we have single authorization decision points to multiple decision points, how are we going to manage large numbers of subpopulation groups as opposed to large single cohorts? How are we going to design and develop and apply reassessments of data subsequently to the, to the launch program? How are we going to get the, those benefits and values really understood? 
And pharma companies, when you talk to them about this, you know, are really facing three really core challenges. The first is a very fundamental issue about just raw capability. So we carried out an analysis recently to try and estimate the number of biostatisticians, healthcare analytical resources that we needed just in the UK alone. And if you do a comparative analysis between the amount of resources that are available in the US and the, and the amount of resources that should therefore be required in the UK, we find a gap of something between 17,000 and 19,000 people. So there's a huge gap in terms of just the basic skills to collect, analyze data, to use data in, in, in a clinical setting, to build the necessary skills to have the necessary biostaticians available to do the basic work. So there's a capability challenge, even at the most fundamental level. The second area where there's huge challenges is the whole issue of how do we build a viable model where we can get absolute assurance of the privacy of data to patients and at the same time increase the availability of information on individual patients in order to drive the analytical resources that we have to put into place and how do we do that economically. And the concern we have in a number of countries is that that problem is not being solved. That in fact the ability to get hold of the data is becoming more challenging and more difficult and when it is available the costs associated with building all the systems to clean the data, to achieve high levels of consent among patient populations, to ensure privacy, to make the use of that data transparent, all that architecture is becoming increasingly very complex and expensive to build. But in some ways those are all solvable. They're resource questions, they're challenges that are going to be learnt over time. The really central challenge is how profound the Agile model is in challenging so many of the fundamental tenets of the pharmaceutical industry that has grown up over the last hundred years. It's going to require a completely new set of leadership skills. You know, Team-based science is become, not going to become just important, it's going to become the norm. The ability to, to run scientific investigations in a non-linear way, the ability to build more interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary models, the ability to actually operate more cross-functionally, the ability to engage more and more stakeholders, in an organized way requires a new set of leadership. And if you talk to the farm industry, they are struggling with that. There are no proven models out there today about how agile pathways and personalized medicine is going to be adopted. Should it be run as a separate division? Should it be integrated within the existing business? Should it be integrated at a therapeutic area level? Should it report to a senior director as part of the organizational structure? Or should it be embedded in the existing process? Those decisions have not yet been made. So there are a whole set of challenges, really practical challenges, right down from actually what are the basic skills that are required, how do we organize those skills, how do we strategically design businesses to implement personalized medicine that will need to be addressed. And they're not straightforward, they are complex, and they are going to be expensive. But that's only the pharma side of the equation. If we then go and look at on the healthcare side, um, we have a a similar sets of problems in terms of capabilities and resources and protocols and training and development. But we have another set of problems to do with the underlying cost dynamics. So if we look at this structure here, there's not an enormous amount of data available on this, but we've been analyzing how the cost behavior occurs in personalized medicine at the front line in hospitals. And in a very simple model, which the one that I, we put together here, is that you can look at the costs into three main buckets. So the first bucket is the actual equipment, the sequencing technology, the green blob on the bottom right-hand side of the diagram. The good news about that particular cost bucket is it is subject to significant improvements in terms of economies of scale and experience curves. Unfortunately, it's usually a very small proportion of the total costs in terms of the delivery of a personalized medicine model in a hospital clinical setting. The bad news is that labor top left, blue bob, probably on estimates something between 30 and 40 percent of the total cost of implementing personalized medicine, what second highest cost bucket, is not subject to significant economies of scale. That every time we put a new personalized medicine model in, we just add more incremental costs, and those costs do not decline over time. Because it's a highly complex, not just personalized medicine from a scientific perspective, it's a personalized delivery system. 
And even in the consumables that do have elements of cost reduction and economies of scale, the biggest single chunk over half, those cost economies only really occur in very, very large hospital systems. So we have another set of complexities here, which is not just that we have some significant costs and capabilities to build, some of those costs and capabilities will rise incrementally. So there's an overall sort of pattern begins to emerge here that there are significant potential improvements in, uh, which are really significant in terms of personalized medicine. So halving the amount of time it takes a drug to come to market. So the US figures for, you know, for the 51 odd drugs that have been through the process from the average time of 90 months down to 50 months. You know, big potential opportunities to save costs in terms of more target, more focus. But that needs to be offset against more complexity in terms of delivery, more cost, uh, more cost incremental cost over time. So the question is, where's the trade-off? How much will the benefits actually outweigh the costs? We can't just answer that question by looking at cost dynamics. We also have to look at pricing. So there are two basic fundamental tenets that are generally held today. Um, the first is the cost containment model. The basic principle is that a large number of the drugs that we use today in the traditional model, we all know, have limited impact. So asthma, 43% of drugs are inefficient. Cancer, 75% of drugs are inefficient. Uh, even uh, relatively simple drugs dealing with blood thinning, less than half are truly effective. So the underlying rationale says we have a new drug, personalized medicine model. We can now target more specifically the patients where it works. We can have much better efficacy, much lower side effects, and at the same time, we can reduce costs because we can remove a significant amount of weightage for the system. And there is evidence that that argument is, is absolutely sound. So if we look at Herceptin, here's the data from a recent study in Switzerland, looking at early stage breast cancer patients. You can see on the left-hand column, lifetime costs without Herceptin, 32,000. 53, if you use on average the entire population, gets Herceptin. If you target it, the cost drops to 38. And you can see the improvement in the fourth, quality, in the fourth column around quality. If you don't target a very, very, very small, marginal, statistically not relevant, incremental efficacy improvement in terms of quality, 0 0.0009, if you target, you can see the clear benefit from an efficacy perspective, 0.4865. So the story kind of holds together, but it really only holds together in, in two scenarios. It holds together, first of all, for the first drugs entering the market. What clearly happens is if you, when you enter the first drug, you get the, all the benefits of that particular drug against the target population, and you get significant improvement in terms of reduced wastage. But every time you enter a new precision drug into the same therapeutic area, those cost dynamics become less attractive. The wastages become lower and lower. So unless you have a really efficient way of valuing the benefit of precision medicine, there's a risk that every time you put a new drug into play, two things happen. First of all, every time you, this is a study in another cancer area, every time you add a new drug to that, no matter how efficient it is, it pushes up costs. It can also, also obviously, because it's targeted, improve outcomes and efficacy, but it does push out costs. And if those pricing models aren't really accurate, it also reduces cost effectiveness. So we have a, here an issue that as more and more personalized medicine goes into play, we can see models where we are going to get improved performance in terms of outcomes, but we're also going to get substantial increases in costs. And those costs may not always be cost effective. And that leads to the second argument. The second argument is that pharma companies rightly look at new generation drugs and they talk about the benefits of precision. So they can target a population, they can deliver a specific drug, they're able to produce much clearer benefits, they're able to reduce the number of side effects. And the net result of that in any logical model says, how do we premium price? And again, the logic of that is, is completely sound. You know, more targeted drugs, more efficiently deployed, less wastage, premium price. But the question is, is the premium pricing being done accurately? And there's some questions about that. So the recent Tufts study, very interesting question it raises. So in their analysis, that only around about 20% of the drugs they looked at, 136 in the registry, actually had a demonstrated improvement in cost effectiveness. So even though 
the other drugs were de delivering much better in areas of improvement, they weren't getting a cost-effective return on that. So let me just start to paint a slightly different scenario than Moore's law. We're seeing a situation where we do see tremendous improvements in the technology. We do see really substantial improvements in terms of patient outcomes, in terms of quality of care, and in terms of certain areas of improvements in productivity. But we also see increasing costs, increasing capabilities, increasing complexity, and issues around pricing. And this has happened before. So rather than Moore's law, let me paint a picture, and we'll call it Gansler's law. So Gansler was a US defense economist who spent 20 years looking at the cost of military technology. And he paints a very similar picture in terms of military technology and aircraft costs as we've been discussing today about personalized medicine. US aircraft today are much more effective, much more precise. They're much more complex. They require much higher levels of support. And their individual unit costs have driven up dramatically. So if we look here, I'm a bit of an aircraft buff, so these sort of things really excite me. But third generation, F-14. So if you watched, ever even know what F-14 is, but if I told you uh, Top Gun, that's F-14s. Highly effective aircraft, the main, main st stay of the United States the Navy. Average unit costs, 75 to 80, somewhere between 20 and 25 million. The number one aircraft in the world today is the F-22 Raptor. Fantastic aircraft, tremendous performance problem costs between 250 and 350 million dollars a unit. Even the United States cannot afford more than 180 of them. So this is a different cost curve. This is a cost curve that describes a world where we have really significant improvements in performance. I mean, there is no way an F-14 would survive more than five minutes air combat against an F-22. In fact, it wouldn't even get within 100 miles of the aircraft. But the costs of that level of improvement in performance are substantial. And that has implications, because if personalized medicine follows the same graph, follows the same Gansler law, we start living in a world where personalized medicine becomes a very small part of our world. It would only be used for very, very specific diseases, probably with children, probably with high mortality rates, where there was no other choice, or it would be used by a very limited percentage of the world population the top 0.1% top, top of people who could afford this level of treatment. So if we're not careful, we could run in a world where this huge scientific advance doesn't have the kind of wide spell impact that it could have because it would become a privileged treatment. So we have to think about that. Now this is not an inevitable future. There are things we can do about that. And the most important thing we can do about that is we need to be able to really measure precisely the input costs and output benefits of precision medicine. To be able to compare the relative treatment costs within a therapeutic area, between therapeutic areas, to understand those costs and outcomes very precisely, and to do it within the structure of the individual drugs and devices in the context of pathways. And then we have to translate that knowledge into very sophisticated multiple indication-based pricing and value-based pricing. So my concluding statement is the following, is personalized medicine, first of all, involves precision science. But the second thing it involves is precision economics. We are going to have to see a corresponding improvement in the economics and understanding of healthcare which parallels the sophistication that the scientists are creating in the scientific field, because if we don't do that, the potential that we all believe that personalized medicine has will not be delivered. And I'd like to leave you with that thought and hand over to Kim.